เป็นเดือดได้ Let's keep on. Um, folks, I'm really conscious of the whole debt by a thousand welcomes and all that sort of stuff. So Lawrence is going to give a bit of an introduction, but just on behalf of Sport Not Our Time or National Hydro Center, it's good to in, good to welcome Dr. E. E. Aki to the center. It's going to I'm sure give us a really interesting talk on all sorts of aspects of uh, sport and culture and sport and environment. So in New Zealand. So if you want to give us a bit of background that would be great. Thank sure. you very much. Well, thanks, um, thanks for having us here, uh, folks. Look at the turnout. And I know it's not the best, the most convenient time to do so, but <coughs> my name's Lawrence McBride, for people who don't know me. I have a company called Far and Wild, and we were set up initially as a community interest company, uh, which does outdoor pursuits, but effectively has, has at its core two social aims. One is to develop people, and the other one is to sustain the environment. So we're a slightly different creature than most just private providers, but we spend probably a good 80 90 percent of our time looking and feeling like everybody else. Um, we undertook a bit of research uh, last year um, in Scotland and New Zealand, funded by the Winston Churchill Foundation. And um, it was around how green the adventure tourism sector is. Um, so effectively, we're looking at best practice right around the world in terms of the footprint and I suppose the approach to people like ourselves to the environment in terms of not only their policies but like <coughs> what type of take they had in the environment because the environment effectively was their, their work in context as opposed to a building or anything else. So Scotland was really interesting because they have their outdoor access code and equal kind of rights around the use of the outdoors between all the different users, landowners, people who want to protect habitat and um, people who want to use the habitats. And then New Zealand, the reason I, I kind of decided to go to New Zealand, not just that it was a junket as some people would have suggested, <laughs> uh, that was there somewhere in my mind, but um, New Zealand actually had published a baseline survey on the impact of the outdoor sector. They also had a brand called Pure, 100% Pure New Zealand, which is a tourism brand, and they put it in that research. I became aware of both of these things, and um, I suppose I thought, well, the policy paper was a baseline was kind of published at a ministerial level in about 2004, and it must have moved on a bit because when you read it, it was largely focusing on the footprint of big hotels and transport companies, um, you know, effectively evaluating their carbon footprint. And I thought, well, it's for the whole adventure tourism sector, so it must have dropped down to to. Uh, the smaller companies and maybe big centres like the um, like we're bound in New Zealand, uh, the PC, which is a ceremony sort of kind of centre. So I'd arrange visits with the, those guys to go out and spend a bit of time, bit of time with them, and ask them all these fundamental questions. And it just happened to arrive by pure coincidence. I think when I was when I was throughout the whole planning period, when I was thinking about going, and I thought I thought of New Zealand, that image that he happens to put up. Today would have been maybe what I had in my head in terms of the racial or cultural context that I was walking into. I had no, I had no idea um, about any tension, conflict issues uh, around Maori and what they call Pakeha in New Zealand. Uh, it was completely green in that regard. But being <coughs> in where I'm from, uh, arriving on Watangi Day, which is Peace Settlement Agreement Day, it was literally like arriving here on the 12th of July with everything <laughs> kicking off. And I first thing I got my hair carpet on the radio, off we go, and it was like, oh, I'm home again, you know what I mean? <laughs> a couple of thousand miles away, but here we go. Um, but fortunately, through a girl called um, Catherine Mack, who writes the, the, the Green Green Guide to Ireland, and is an eco-journalist, she had introduced me to a man called Joe Doherty, and despite the name, uh, is and was a Maori um, outdoor provider like ourselves based in Rotorua. Sadly passed away now, Joe, but um, Joe has ancestors from Inishowen and have been coming back and forth to Inishowen, but also was doing what he does um, in New Zealand. And they introduced me to the way his company worked, which was an eye-opener. And from that, from really day two on, I was kind of thinking, well, I'll go to um, and Hillary, I'll go to um, <coughs> Like we're buying all the rest, but really what is interesting here is what those guys are saying. And he was somebody who I never met until today, <laughs> but had a very interesting telephone conversation when I came off a hike. Um, 
I've been avoiding my calls reportedly because they thought I was English. <laughs> when, I, when I learned I was Irish, I think I, I might have changed something. Well, um, a bit of a long journey that he is now here with us today to share some of his insights. Because certainly, what began to take me was the kind of questions he was asking me and uh, information he was passing me about where it was with married people in terms of what we do in the outdoors and how they take it. And um, without further ado. I am going to take the stage and ask about your work. I am going to take the stage and ask about your work. I am going to take the stage and ask about your work. Lawrence doesn't know what's going to happen yet, he's a little bit concerned. <laughs> 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 he spoke on the phone for probably a good hour when he was over in New Zealand, and I don't know what he was thinking then, because he still invited me after that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, my background is in, uh, officially I'm a sports psychologist. Uh, I've got a PhD in sports psychology. Uh, I lectured in, uh, lectured in Otago University for 10 years, uh, I lectured in uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, Sultan, Prince Sultan University in the Middle East, and I wrote my PhD partly in Virginia University, uh, some work in UBC in Canada, and some in New Zealand as well. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is encompasses a whole range of different areas that we're interested in in Aotearoa, New Zealand, around uh, health, uh, physical activity, sport, and more recently, outdoor education. Uh, I was on the, the national board for Outdoors New Zealand, maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, the field that I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, the reintroduction of old information from our past as Māori. It's only just arriving on, on the scene and in the sector. The sector's a little bit concerned about it because uh, they've got to get themselves upskilled pretty quickly. Government are even more worried about it because they don't know what it looks like, but they're asking for this information to be included in any national uh, proposals. So I'm getting a lot of phone calls at the moment from groups putting in proposals saying uh, what should we include and I'm saying well you can put down anything you like because the government can't assess it. So it's a funny situation to be in. <laughs> We're well ahead of uh, what the demand looks like but uh, also pretty informal speaking style. If you want to jump in at any stage and ask questions I'm happy with that. Uh, I've done a couple of presentations here. I got here on Monday and I did one at the uh, University of Oxford. You know, I drove down to Limerick. She said, I'm not so bloody far, I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I tore off down there, did one down at that place. That was lovely. And someone told me it was called Stab City. I didn't see any stabbing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then came back and did another presentation to uh, staff at the university in Georgetown again last night. And we're starting to this uh, last part of the leg. I've got a Tuesday, one tomorrow, and then I head off to Edinburgh on Saturday. And uh, University of Edinburgh hosting me there for a couple of days. And I'm in um, Canada, the uh, World Indigenous uh, Innovation and Health Conference, presenting there in Alaska with the uh, National Indian Education Assembly. That's um, all First Nations people up there. And I made my way to Ireland from Latvia. I was there for the World Motocross Champ, so I've jammed about a <laughs> a short space here. My government uh, funded me to be here. Um, when I say fund, I, I take their money and I do as I please with it. Uh, but one of the things I'm quite keen to get from this process is feedback from you that I can use for evidence to our government that there's others that are potentially interested in what we're doing. Uh, it's really pushing the field hard. Uh, there's a lot of um, questions still to be answered. Uh, I've been researching this field for probably the last five years. It developed out of um, work that I had been doing with the Māori community in the North Island of New Zealand. And I reintroduced pre-European Māori sport into the community. What followed on from that was a lot of questions about where it had been and how come they didn't know anything about it. So the last five years I've been researching the origin of all physical activity, including outdoor, uh, from the arrival of Māori to New Zealand. And the stuff that I've been finding is incredible, in my opinion. Uh, it's got so much connection to the environment, in terms of using the environment as 
uh, a form of a textbook to understand how we're going to perpetuate our genetic material. And that's been the part that's um, blown a lot of our people away, so they haven't seen this in over 100 years, they don't know much about it. I know 100 years in terms of Ireland, the UK is bugger all, but to us it's quite a bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've only been here a couple, well, we've only been colonised for the last maybe 180 years or so. Mark had been in uh, New Zealand for 1,300 years. Um, it was the last place almost on the planet to be people because it's a difficult place to get to. South Pacific uh, is a nasty ocean. Not many people managed to cross over, but uh, we've got ourselves here. I was saying the Lawrence is a running joke with us in the Hawaiians that they say as well. You know, the smart ones stayed in Hawaii because it was warmer. <laughs> we tell them all the hard ones carried on. The soft ones stayed here, so depends on the perspective. They definitely have memories of us being there and some of the historical accounts tell about what we did when we were there. Uh, our language is identical to uh, Easter Islanders, uh, Tahitians, and Rarotongans as well. And we can understand the wine, mostly. So the similarities are huge. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today are the environmental deities that we're using as evidence for how we can improve health and physical activity, sport, outdoor ed, awareness, but without a focus on that. Which seems a little backwards to most, but that's just a, an incidental <coughs> outcome of collecting together knowledge about uh, the environment. And that's the interesting part for our people, is that to this point there's been nothing that has uh, impeded the progress of poor health amongst Maori. Um, I'm not sure why I put that photo up, just kind of a random one that most Kiwis turn up with something to do with a haka, but uh, as far as my colleagues are concerned, this is a commodification of culture where Adidas are using our haka to sell uh, product. So sometimes we put that up to say, well, everything isn't rosy when you see a haka. Uh, the, the tribe that's responsible for um, the haka that's used by the All Blacks, they're not happy about it still. So I think it's seen better than they are sometimes. Uh, the irony again is that I haven't used um, Maori health statistics in any talk I've done probably the last 10 years. Uh, but because I'm out of the country and uh, to inform you about what's going on, I've introduced a couple. We've pushed them into footnotes now. We don't discuss them as Maori people. <coughs> jammed down our throats for the last 30 years, we're over it. So we're shifting into another space. Quite to give you some idea of the state of the nation for Maori, we've got the worst health stats of any indigenous group on the planet. Here's some of my students. We've got bloody gangsters, most <laughs> <laughs> A few other ones there, infant death is the one that we're most embarrassed about. We kill more of our own children through beating them to death than any other indigenous people on, on the planet as well. And yet we put forward as part of our culture of, of the importance of family. It's the biggest lie there is. But we're trying to make some adjustments around it. Another one there with our vehicle death. Uh, Maori are high risk. We'll have a go no matter what. So often in uh, jobs where uh, high risk potential for um, injury will go to those and, and, and be highly presented. This number here is um, all non-Maori and Pacific Island people combined still have half the amount of vehicle death we do as Maori. So uh, crazy stuff we get up to. And part of the, the rationale probably behind that is that uh, in our society the pursuit of mana or uh, pride for our collective tribe group is everything. Nothing comes below that. So if there's an affront to us as an individual, that becomes a tribal issue. And we'll take whatever steps we think, rightly or wrongly, will uh, set that straight. So violence towards women, we believe wrongly. That's part of our culture, is to um, have a uh, woman that are below us, and it was never the case. So we're trying to re-educate the Maori society that what's acceptable. So high risk is something that we do a lot of. Um, I'm one of them too. <laughs> Been in a wheelchair twice now. We're doing dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that one? Uh, I raced motocross about as well. So I broke my back and then I broke both legs and an arm a couple of days or a couple of years after that. 
I'm built for rugby, not rugby. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the sport and I work in the sport a bit. And so some of my athletes said, yeah, try this. Well, yeah, it didn't work out. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was interesting to make the connection to that and understand some of the pressures they're under. Now, uh, this is where it starts to get more interesting from my perspective about engaging with the environment. This place here is uh, Milford Sound, just in the South Island. Um, 400 inches of rain a year. Uh, the field here has maybe 12 feet of fresh water on top of the seawater. So when you dive there, uh, you have animal and plant life or, or, or coral that is normally at 600 feet, is at 30 because of the mixing together the tannins from the fresh water and the runoff from the forest onto the layer of sea. It's a really interesting place to go and visit. Plus I've got massive lobster or crayfish here. So that's another reason to get in the water. Uh, at the mouth of this place is um, one of the traditional sites for collecting green stone, which as a pre-European Maori society was uh, one of the things that drove us. Uh, it's a, it was a form of economy. For us, um, only chiefs had it. Uh, everybody wanted it, and there were only three or four places you could get it. And all of them sat on, and all of them really difficult places to access, and this is one of them. Now, um, what I did in April was I took a group of eight Māori health providers to the South Island and started into the process of reintroducing them to their environment and educating them on what the uh, deities are of different parts of those environments, or the gods, if you want to call it. The gods are a difficult word for us to use uh, because of the missionary influence at home. Some of my people see the use of God as... Uh, an affront to their Christian beliefs, even though before missionary arrival we had none of those. It's interesting for me to see how far down the, the whole of colonization quite a few of our people still are. Be that as, it's, as it is, uh, gods, deities, we're messing around with some of the words here to see what we can come up with. Uh, I took them back into these places here to show them the pathway that our people used in the previous thousand or so years to get access to Ponam or Greenstone. And it's the first trip of its type into this place. Um, I'm a little bit unusual because I work down here as a guide and there aren't any Māori that work in these places in the South Island. In fact, in the whole outdoor ed sector, that's uh, two or three, that's it. It's very rare. Um, I lived in the South Island even though I'm from the North because my father worked on hydroelectrical places down there and that's where most of them are. So I grew up in places like this. Um, but all of my relations have uh, very little connection to mountains, no number of snow, and especially places like this. So uh, reintroducing the, the sector back into these places has been eye-opening for a lot of them because they've never been, they've never touched snow. They don't go into these places. And it's been really exciting to be involved with it. Uh, and what we've been doing is starting out with the knowledge base of the area and showing how there's connections between us and specific aspects of the environment. So we can show a lineage from a person to a rock or a person to a particular tree and we can name them all the way down. And we haven't been able to do that for quite a while and we've been reintroducing really that process and it's been really interesting to see the reaction of um, our communities uh, and the buy-in. The recruitment has been massive. Because at this point, uh, those health stats that I showed you earlier, there's been no shift. In fact, they've been worsening. So we're trying to come up with an innovative approach that uh, is going to get our people mobilised again. And that's what we're trying to do with the connection to the environment. Is this okay so far? Mm -hmm. I see anyone looking at their watch or looking at the roof. <laughs> it's probably time to wrap it up, eh? No one will give me the nod. <laughs> Just give me a nod too when we get towards the time frames that you want to wrap this thing up. If there's any questions, jump in at any stage. So what we've done is we've shifted away from the focus of the individual. The, the mainstream medical model is that uh, the government doesn't pay attention to us unless there's an illness. And because we are so highly represented in the medical system, we're a cash cow of the government. So I don't know that there's any intent of cure. And certainly, uh, if we were removed from that uh, process, the government would have no job. Because we're doing pretty well for them here. Uh, but in Maori society, a focus on the individual isn't consistent with how we've worked and everything else. We will always start out with our connection to a mountain first, then to our river, and we work ourselves down until we get to the individual. 
And often in a situation like this in New Zealand, if we were Māori, or speaking to a Māori group, we won't introduce ourselves. We'll start at, we're saying what our mountain is, and they have to figure it out. And usually they can, because uh, we'll say certain things that cue them into where we're from. I'm from a river, and people know that when I talk about particular things, that that's where I'm from. And often to speak about yourself is seen as um, arrogant, because a mountain has been there for thousands of years. You're 80 years, and you think that your name is more important than that of a mountain. It's kind of uh, crazy, in our opinion. So, uh, health, though, has started the other way around. It's always been about the individual, which I would suspect is why it's failed, because it's not consistent with any other process we have as mark. So we're shifting them back to the bigger picture of understanding knowledge, our connections to it, and how environments provide metaphors for how we can improve our health. So uh, it's a bit of a backdoor process, and some of them we're informing that that's what we're trying to do, some of them we don't. We just take them out into the bush and let them go. Now, I'll show you a bit of video footage here, if I can bring that up, um, of that group that I took down there. I've been working with them for the last couple of years. Uh, I didn't tell them much about what was going to happen down there other than it would be uh, difficult, challenging, inspiring for some of them, uh, cause some trouble for others. Uh, but they knew that from historically my connection with them that it would be something different. So uh, I'll show you a little bit of footage about that. Uh, what I did with this group was from that area there, I uh, took them for a 50k run in one hit. I'm not much of a runner these days, I've been broken too many times, but I can still, uh, how would you put it, bullshit my way through 50k if I have to. <laughs> and then Ken, and uh, young fellas, these are all CrossFit fellas, all pretty strong and fit and thinking that they can handle but when it comes to getting into the mountains and the places that I know, I can still manage to get through there okay. So that was the first thing up was the... Uh, the track that I took them through is called the Rukbin, or um, Taraka from the Māori perspective, and it was a pathway we used to get Greenstone out. It's well known at home. It's right next to the Milford track, which is one of the top ten in the world. I think this one here is probably <coughs> underrated and equal to the other one. And when I took them to the start of it, I said, well, we're going to have a bit of a trot today. We're going to go for a wee look around. We're here to visit the mountain, and we're here to interpret the, the soil, the rocks, and so on as uh, genealogical connections through our feet by the process or the medium of running across it. So we're not here for health, we're not here for a run, we're not here for physical activity. You're just going to be out there for a long time and get a lot of opportunities to connect. Now to start with, when you start running up a hill, it's going to be about you. And it's going to be a conversation in your head where you think, this sucks. I can't handle, I'm not fit enough, this is hurting. Which is probably what happens with a lot of our young people who take them out into the mountains and they start to think, this isn't very much fun. I don't like this, and it's an internal conversation a lot of people have about thinking that I could be somewhere else. And as they start to spend more time there, they transition into another space where they open their eyes and they see other things around, which all of you are well aware of that process. Well, it's an opportunity to do the same thing with us, uh, just in a different uh, capacity that we were rediscovering the pathways of their ancestors using that trail to get Greenstone out. So that was the, the main driver for being there. Now the trail itself is 38 k's, um, and I did mess with their heads a little bit. <coughs> being a sports psych, it's kind of my job. Um, I said to Mike, we're gonna go for a trot over the top here and have a look at the other side. Uh, when I got them to the other side, I added another um, 12 or 15 k's on, um, because the pathway for taking Greenstone out came to a river where it was processed and cut into pieces. It's harder than steel Greenstone. So it's very difficult to um, manipulate. Uh, and the location where it was worked was another 12 or 15 k's from the end of this track. And I said, well, this track was designed by the Department of Conservation. It's got nothing to do with us. So if you think it ends there, maybe. But for us, it doesn't. And I said, if this is the extent of the genealogy that's been passed on by your ancestors to stop here, stay in the van. Don't come on any further. But if you think you've got a little bit more juice in the tank, and you think you deserve the right to be here next to us as a reflection of what your ancestors have given us, then you have an obligation to carry on. They was just messing with their heads again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so what I said to them is when we arrived there, because when they got there, the van was waiting and they 
were into the van, they were eating handfuls of cake and anything they could find because they'd been running for eight hours. And they were a little bit messed up in the head. And they were watching me and they said, how come you're not eating? I said, well, because we've got a bit further to go, but it's your choice. It's my favorite line with a challenge by choice, which means get off your ass. <laughs> so um, they started to run again. I said, look, you only need to do another 500 meters or a K or whatever you want to. But I spoke to the van driver and I said, don't pick them up till it's dark. Leave them out there, let them cop. And when it got darker and they'd been running for eight hours, then things started to go on in their head. And my main rationale for doing that was that uh, they learn more about what's happening in our communities because the things that we're asking our communities to, to do are the equivalent of what I've just asked them to do. So someone that's you know, 200 kilos asking them to do a walk around the block to improve their health is the equivalent of them having to run 50 k's. And I said, until you understand that space, you're no use to our people because uh, your expectations are out of line with what our communities can actually handle and especially about reconnecting places like this, because I've never been there. So it was a real interesting process. I'll, it's only a few minutes long, I'll run that up and see how you go. second Maori health providers, well that chip there, he's a teacher from one of the native schools. They ran over these two passes here. Walk sideways through these hills. Oh, there's on. I'm impressed. <laughs> about an hour and a half in, let's have a bit of a breather here. Uh, Pai Raimundo has got a thousand calories burned. And, uh, Really good. Typical CrossFit really from the uh, comment here, right? Yeah. <laughs> what was really good to see was the CrossFit fellas, they hurt the most. That chap there with his back to us, he's really interesting. I'll talk to you a little bit more about him in a moment. He won't eat anything unless he has an ancestral connection to it. That river there is the only river where you can get green stone. And it's in the middle of nowhere. How we found it, I'm not sure either. Up there. Up over the top onto the other side. And the body is starting to get a little bit mumbai now. Mumbai's pain. Definitely starting to tip into my mental strength a little bit. I just keep going. There was a point there. I just wanted to cry. I was the tail of the group, way behind, just kept tripping up, and just going really slow and by mountain. Almost got to me, did it for That was the end point of that track where they thought they were finished and done. <laughs> so I finished the route burn, um, and then I decided to do run for an extra about 12 heads. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's like when your mind has prepared itself to go for X amount of time and then you have to go a little bit further, um, yeah, it requires mental toughness, which I think will be a challenge. So, um, so you get the idea of some of the places we're taking them into is uh, a new idea for some of them. But one they're starting to um, grasp. So we're doing the same in the sea. We're uh, paddling out in the open ocean. We're not paddling flat water on outrigger canoes as competition. We're trying to reconnect them in a more authentic way. And it's got some uh, quite tough outcomes if we're not successful out there as far as, you know, you're out in the open ocean and we've got to look after ourselves, so pushing them. Uh, this was on the other side of the field as we came over. This is where we ended the run was on this side. And uh, Mike grew up fairly near there. I spent 25 years in the area, messing around in the mountains. 
Um, that's near Queenstown. Um, it's a popular tourist area, but up that end of the lake, there's not many people um, come up there. After they finished their um, run, they had a 130k mountain bike ride to go. Um, and that one challenged them a little bit as well. Pushed them into another space. Um, there were some questions about how we could use a mountain bike when there was no mountain bikes in pre-European times. It's a fair question. Uh, but I said, we're not interested in the bike, we're interested in the mountain. And the bike is a medium for the delivery of ancestry that we can get further into and explore more by. So it's literally and metaphorically a, a vehicle for us to do things that are exceptional these days for Mark. You guys doing okay? Mm -hmm. You know, you're the hardest bikers to read. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you're not too bad. You smile occasionally, but I did my first talk on Monday and I rang my wife. And I've got really low standards too. And she says, how did it go? And I said, well, no one called me a dickhead. And no one called me a dickhead. <laughs> but it must have been on the tip of their tongues, I tell you, because they were the hardest people I've ever worked with. It's gotten better. And you guys are okay, actually, you're grinning occasionally, so we'll see. There's still time to be called a dickhead and dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've been doing is, uh, we've got three different sectors in Maori society, and probably most where there's those that understand traditional concepts and ideas, and are keen to connect up with those. And they're sold on these ideas of showing ancestral prevention. There's another bigger group that are um, urbanised. They have um, different interests. <coughs> well, your accent's worse than mine. I tell you, I can't understand anybody that talks here. <laughs> so uh, that, that contemporary urbanised group in the middle, they're probably the biggest group, and they're sitting on the fence about whether to engage. So I'm developing programs that can connect with them through CrossFit, for example, through um, other mediums that they're interested in. I'm not particularly, but you know, it's something that they want. There was another thing that happened a couple of years ago, uh, Zumba. <laughs> Frankly, I could give a rat's ass about Zumba. <laughs> I'm not from South America, I don't want to do it, but our people do, so we have to get instructors and we have to learn how to do Zumba. It's the worst half hour of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, we engage with that, but CrossFit's another one that's going on. And they want some access to that, so we've been building um, uh, ancestry-based CrossFit programs. And how we manage to do that is we've got a whole range of different opportunities or lines that we can follow to, to achieve that. But one of the ones that we've done for this, or I've um, written up, and the other thing too is that um, there's quite a lot of this on uh, YouTube now. So we've been loading these onto YouTube about how to use your environment for different uh, physical activity outcomes or health outcomes without focusing on those. Um, CrossFit was just one of those. Now the, the ancestral connection I used was homeopathic to get. And I've seen a few examples or must be his relations along the way because they're ferns. And he's the deity of ferns. Or so anything that grows wild is connected to this particular deity. Um, because he was promiscuous. He would sleep with anybody and things would just grow. And so that was the idea behind him and what he did. Now from that, at the base of that, is the root of the, the plant, the radohe, which is the fern's name, and the ohe is the root. And as pre-European Māori, we used to eat the root, because it's a form of carbohydrate, that as we were moving, if we were off to war, we would eat that. Tastes like shit. Still does. Um, and recently found that it's uh, carcinogenic as well. <laughs> so not encouraging to go back to that as a food source. <coughs> And it bugs your teeth too, just to clean things off. But, uh, um, the root was something that we used a lot. Uh, now the monehu, from our perspective, are the spores that come off ferns. And ngārara, which are insects, in our opinion, came from the spores of the fern. So some of our insects have a ancestral connection back up through this line to this chap, Omiya Tikitika, who's the deity of ferns. Okay, so that's one of the rationales we use. Now as far as that part's concerned, that gives us our knowledge base, our connection. Now we have to change that into a metaphor for how we can get some physical activity or sport output from that, which is exactly what we did with it. Now, if one of the interesting things here is that Confucius, um, in their society, developed martial arts around the same concepts with grasshopper, with praying mantis, with uh, tigers, with crania, same kinds of principles of understanding the environment, who's moving about in it, 
and turning that into a martial art to ensure that the people that he protected could protect themselves and ensure genetic continuity. We used to do the same things and we're just reproducing it. So globally, people know about Kung Fu. And hopefully, in another five years, they'll know about Atsu and Matsu concepts of how you can use the environment to get the same things. And that's where we're here. I can show you a quick <coughs> example of it. Um, one of the insects that I talk a little bit about is um, raw tane. And raw tane is the stick insect. Now in uh, CrossFit there's quite a big drive around um, abdominal strength, uh, core strength. And so we looked at the behavior and characteristics of raw tane and how it moves. And we would take people in for four or five sessions to firstly find it and we have the incidental gain of moving about in that environment just to find it. Then we studied it for a, a while, and then we picked certain things out, and we started to change our people's perspectives of those insects uh, into another space, with CrossFit maybe being one of the incidental outcomes of understanding how a stick insect works. So what I'll do is I'll get this chap here to come out here. You need to be able to see him from there. He's going to lie on the ground and show us a bridge hole or a plank. Plank, yeah. yeah. So this is the first form, and sometimes what we do is if we want it to be easy, we let them go onto their knees. So that's probably the, the EWOP version, is up from the knees. So they go to the knees, then they go to this, the next one is up onto the hands. And from there, what we do is we get left hand and right leg up and off the ground. Okay, have a rest for a moment now, while I talk a bit more. So that was the introduction to it. Now the next thing is, possible. so this is what you might be doing in CrossFit, some of those kinds of movements. Now what we want you to do is to shift into the idea of how Tafri Mate, who's the deity of wind, will affect Homeo Tikitiki, who's the deity of the insects, by how your hand and foot will move, depending on what level of wind we have. So if we'd left the door open each time those rattled, his hand and foot should move more, because there's more presence of the deity of wind. So now what we're trying to get our people to do is to move into the idea of thinking like a stick insect, and not thinking about strength and conditioning at all. So if you hop up onto you where you were before, and want your hand and your foot to move as though it's the wind that's shifting you. Think about the stick insect and how they hold onto a branch. So their hand's not going to be here, it's in this cupping position where they hold onto a, a branch as they're moving. Okay? <laughs> so now your foot and leg have to move up and down slowly. Foot goes up with it. Okay, if it bent there, a bird would come and smash it, wouldn't it? <laughs> so move it up and down. So like that. Yeah, and it's got to move up and down so the wind is manipulating. <laughs> Better. That's not bad, is it? Really? Okay, have a rest. So his genetic material might carry on as the form of the stick insect, but he's able to convince the <coughs> bird that he's not a stick insect, he's a stick, because the wind's moving him. So we have to get our people into that space. Now the next level up from this, so if you have one more go at it, we want our left leg and left arm. Yeah. Now this is a much harder concept, so what we're trying to do is, as he gets better at this, is to tip him over so that it's flatter through here, rather than having that foot underneath the back one there. So, so you're trying to roll over towards your left a bit more. See how you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, once you get further <laughs> over, it becomes much, much yeah, tougher. Yeah. Now what we want to do is to get to that point in the arm and the leg moving up, and eventually what we want to do is to place their hand, and they're going to slowly move across the floor. And that's the first introduction, and I did have a rest. Actually, give me a clap, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I've written up, 10 different insects and 10 different things or animals that they do or, or the behavior and characteristics they have and showing how that's a form of physical activity but without even focusing on that. So we're there for environmental knowledge, animal knowledge or insect knowledge or bird knowledge for that matter. So we've been developing a whole range of programs and putting them on YouTube. The difficult part is that we've got 140 <coughs> deities to get through <laughs> and there's uh, three areas for each of those. So one is for the physical form, one's for the spiritual, and one's for the psychological. And they have different demands. So we've still got a lot of work to do around that, but we're slowly bringing those ideas back. And that's a contemporary form of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We're having a great time, but it's because it's um, a bit of hope, you know. <laughs> uh, another one we did there was through um, running analysis. So when I was in the phys ed department, I, was, um, I worked a lot with dartfish and, and silicon coach, which are um, te technical, uh, software analysis program, how form looks in particular sports, and we did a lot with our running analysis. One of the things we did with this 
was we took it back to an ancestral connection as well. Now, Hine Tupare Manga is the mother of mountains, and she married Tane, who's the, um, the deity of forests, of birds, of knowledge, and of the separation of um, the sky from the, the earth. So he's got quite a few range of jobs at Jack there. Um, now their first offspring in this particular line, because there was a whole range of different offspring that he had, Pan has got 42 different names because he slept with quite a few different people. <coughs> no TV, rain <laughs> off. Not that dissimilar to here. <laughs> so uh, Tane uh, and Hine came together, and their first offspring was Tuamatu. Tuamatu is seen as the deity of all rocks and stones. And from there, we can come down to uh, Rapohore, uh, Makatiti, and Rangahua. Rangahua is the deity of all river stones. Rapohore is the deity of all river uh, rocks and coastal stones that we find. And Makatiti in the middle is an interesting one because he uh, is involved with, uh, well, his daughters are Hine um, Tua Kirikiri, and she's the deity of gravel. Hine uh, Ononi, and she's the deity of sand. Uh, Mata is flint. Um, Waiwi Waiapa is um, grindstone. Uh, Ponamu is in there, which is the greenstone. And they have various interactions with each other. So grindstone is associated with Parafin Mea, and she's the goddess of fresh water. And those two get together and they attack Ponam. And Ponam, and what they're saying is that that's how you grind Ponam down. You've got to have um, grindstone and water, and you can wear down Ponam. So you can see how we're getting some of the social commentaries through this ancestral line. Now, what occurred to me around the evaluation or assessment of running analysis is that. I had groups that say, well, we heard that running's good for you, but it's hard work. You don't like doing it. And I'm not running anywhere unless there's food at the end of it. Because we'll go pig hunting, and if there's pigs there, or if we're going to dive, then we'll do it. But other than that, the motivation is a little bit different. So I said to them, well, how about you go and find me 10 different surfaces that have ancestral connections? So I want you to find in there to a kitty kitty. And I want you to report back to me how she interacted with you because when you run on gravel, there's a crunching sound. So that's her call to you to start with. And she lets you know how quickly you're moving because it crunches more. Or I want you to run across her and interact with her so that you can't hear your feet on it. And that means you've got to be lighter on your feet. And so the return is going to shift for how your gait will uh, need to uh, change in order to just need to cross it. So uh, I asked them to give me 10 different surfaces and tell me what, what happened. I did another one with the ocean with the Rapahoi, which is the sea rock. I said, when you're there, uh, you can only move when Tamaroa, who's the Atu of the sea, crashes in on a wave that will cover your movement so you can run. But as soon as that sound of the crashing wave is gone, you're going to have to stand still. Otherwise, we know you're coming. So it's a means of developing not only running gait, but ways of moving around next to the sea or in the bush so that no one knows you're there. And we were the masters of that for sure. So it's reintroducing old information with an incidental outcome of physical activity and sport. Here's another one that we used there that um, uh, worked out quite well. As I said, we can do interval training based on the speed of a wave. So when tumble roll comes in and crashes, you start your interval. When he crashes again, your interval ends and you walk back to the start. Because it's a naturally occurring stopwatch. And if you want a, a faster or longer interval, choose a flatter beach because it's going to take long for the wave to come back out. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can see the environmental connections, hopefully. It's another area I took some people up into. This one was a little bit more serious. This was 70 k's, uh, but a beautiful area. And once they got over themselves and started looking around, it got easier. I don't know how much longer I can do this, but I'll hang in for a bit more. There's got to be younger fellas and further ones coming through. We'll get there. But what we've been starting is um, what we call um, moment recorded or, or mountain conversations. And what that's about is starting up conversations with our mountains again. Because when we go into those places, usually it's one of fear, of personalised um, uh, concern, saying I can't handle it here, this is too tough, I'm worried about these things, to shift into one of understanding the characteristics and personality traits of that particular mountain. And then shifting into the space that you're not there to conquer. 
you're there to coexist, and you'll only be able to coexist if you understand what their personality traits are. And in some instances, if it's a mountain that comes straight up, that's their character, is to try and break you early. <coughs> but if they don't break you and you can sustain your effort, then they may reward you by letting you ease up into another space later on. And the success of getting past that, you feel in tune, and you start to look around more and think, gee, this isn't too bad, which all of you know about. And we're just changing it into another kind of space for our people to conceptualise. Okay? Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's more people nodding. Why <laughs> uh, social models becomes a big deal in uh, rehab, about using all three of those areas for their capacity to assist rehabilitation. Well, Mark has been doing that for hundreds of years. Because the moment ago I talked to you about our need for addressing your physical, spiritual, and psychological being. So whenever we stand up to greet anybody, we say it three times. And people often say, well, why did you say it three times? It's not because we didn't get hurt us or not. It's because we have to address all three parts. In fact, it's another reason the medical system fails is because they only address the physical part of any Maori's representation of the disease. And if they're successful, they might get half of a third. So they were never going to be able to cure Maori because they don't attend to two thirds. So uh, interesting that biopsychosocial models start to get a bit more leverage. It's the beach down in front of my house um, at home. Uh, my kids bugger around and see a bit down there. They're watching me doing all sorts of animal exercises on the ground there and think that the dad's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll get over it. I've got a thing of going out and mowing the lawn in my underwear when the school bus comes in. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> anyway, uh, what we're pushing them towards here is the idea of. Uh, tribal centrism. They were shifting away from a pan Maori approach, which is a national approach to fix things and making it much more tribal. Because as you'll know, uh, in this space here, this environment is quite different from 100 miles down the road. And the people here reflect that. And when you go to the coast, they reflect some other things on the other side. And their personality traits in our world and our perception of this is uh, indicative of the environment they come from. So if the sea is aggressive, the people tend to be as well, depending on the coast you're on. So our east coast is quite mellow and the people tend to be that way as well, Maori. But the west coast is aggressive and they tend to be that way too. So we've been wondering a bit about that concept of how people are put together as a reflection of the environment <coughs> that they come from. Because the environment has demanded that in order for your genetic material to be perpetuated. So the very way that you're put together in terms of what muscularity you have, your uh, psychological awareness, toughness, attitude towards the environment has been decided by this place. And if you're from the mountains, you tend to have an attitude about uh, how you cope with life. That's a reflection of the place that you come from, because it's demanded it from your people in order for you to survive there. Which I think is bloody interesting. But we haven't thought about it much in that kind of space, have we? Mm -hmm. I think I had a chat with Lawrence on the phone, and there was a big Silent gap there where he was thinking of this guy's an idiot. So I made up this new word, virophysiology. Sounds a bit wanky, but I thought I'd try that. <laughs> <laughs> See where we get to it. In, uh, in the academic circles, they're going, oh, that's a fabulous term, yeah. <laughs> done that before and continues to. You're selected in or out depending on what you need to survive in that place. Now, amongst our people as Māori there's some that are quite tall. From the coast there's some that are black and short and they're good in the forest because you can't see the bugs. <laughs> so there's been some of those trends that have happened over the years and we wondered about why those were. And <coughs> some of that's starting to come to light now about how we can exist in rivers, how we can exist in mountains and so on as a reflection of what uh, the environment's put together for us. So, and I'll, you know, I've been a trainer for 30 years and I can pick where people have been injured usually by how they walk. Uh, what I'd like to be able to do in the next few years is pick where someone's from by how they walk. So 
So that's one of our aims there is to develop the, the area to that point that we can um, make some assumptions. I don't know about this idea. I normally only have a couple of words per slide, but one of my mates wrote this to me the other day. It sounded quite clever. I'm going to give the um, presentation to uh, Lawrence and you can see the Lawrence if you want. I've written some articles on this stuff too, which is a real surprise. I'm the world's worst academic. <laughs> so I got booted out. <laughs> uh, but in this area here, I've been wrong, and that's so unlikely. You know, I normally only go for 10 minutes of sitting still, and then I'm out the door. And, but this is um, capturing my interest and has done for five years now. A um, bit like, you know, mountain biking. Uh, mountain biking. For years, I thought it was about bike. You know, you do <coughs> what you can, and I'm quite proud about that. I don't think it is. It's about the mountain, because the mountain keeps attracting you back to certain places, regardless of what bike you have. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? You've got your favourite ride. Yeah. And here's the other thing about mountain bikes, is that the newest, the latest bike you have is the best thing that's ever happened until you get the next one, and that one's ditched, and you like this new one, don't you? Yeah. So I don't know that it is about the bikes. I wonder about that a bit later. Doesn't stop me from getting five bikes in my garage. So. <laughs> <laughs> this chap's interesting. Um, he's got nine US titles in uh, motocross, well, actually cross country stuff. I've trained him exclusively for the last three years in Mardi concepts of the environment. He doesn't know that he's a white fellow. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's been really successful in what he's doing. And I've only just started to tell him about, did you know actually <laughs> that I was doing some of this stuff? And he said, oh, yeah, I wonder where that came from. So he started to get the idea of it. Uh, internationally, he's known as the fittest man in the sport. And he's from New Zealand. And he's been taught, because I've been in his training for 40 years. And it's been real interesting to see the shift. Because I said, you know, I could give you some Olympic concepts about training, because I know what those are, because I trained through the phys ed school for 10 years. Or I can give you some that are going to get parallel outcomes. And they have because of the uh, um, number of titles he's managed to win. Um, so jump in with your questions and so on, if you need to at any point. Last thing I'll wrap up with is um, I've built a new Māori health framework, which again was a bit of a piss take, I have to say. <laughs> I thought one afternoon, oh, I'll write down a few ideas and I'll build a framework. We haven't had one of those for a long time. It's been 25 years. It took me two weeks to write the bug out, and I thought it would just take an afternoon. Uh, so we produced that and we're starting to travel the country and teach that to a few different organisations. And our idea is to come to other indigenous groups, mainstream eventually, not unlike your group here, and talk about the opportunities to um, <coughs> conceptualise the environment in a different way. And what I'm trying to do is to verbalise that, to put words to what it is we know as outdoor educators exist, but sometimes have difficulty putting our finger on what exactly is that. Well, for us as Māori, we know exactly what it is. It's a connection to knowledge firstly, then it's a connection to that place. And the last two parts of the metaphor is how we can change that into another format that might have an incidental outcome of improving health, but it's still not our focus. The environment is. So, uh, Lawrence has got a copy of the most recent one I've written there. Um, I've got some <coughs> cards here too I'll give to you because uh, I'm really interested in what you've got to say. Also, if you don't mind, if there's a few questions, and I hope there is, um, I might get Lawrence just to catch a bit of footage. Is that okay? Is there, is there any questions so far? <coughs> I've got a little GoPro here, and if there's anything that comes up, I can answer some of your questions now too. Fair, fair, folks, we need to be away in about 15 minutes, so that's just <laughs> he thanks very much for a very informative presentation. I know your style as well, very casual, but underneath it, a lot of serious stuff. Thank you very much. Obviously it's all developed from a Maori perspective because you've got such a close link to nature, the outside. Do you think parallels in terms of physical programs could be developed in the likes of Ireland 
where there might not be such a close link to, or it might be so far removed time-wise, or because people have just been living urban life for too long. Could you develop a program like that elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. No question in my mind at all. I've read some of the mythology before I came here about, and I was asking them some of the questions about, you know, who's this um, Queen Maeve? Maybe. <coughs> and what was this white bull and this brown bull deal? What was going on with some of those things? So those similar metaphors are for engaging are there. They're definitely there. Um, some investigation into what those look like, some innovation around how you can reconceptualise those and to make connections to the environment differently. It's one of the reasons I came here. Actually, I didn't tell you this at the start, but I'm, my other name is Justin McKenna. I'm from Armagh. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather's Irish. Okay. And uh, my mother was born in New Zealand. But uh, I think if I turn up in Armagh and tell them I'm home, they'll look me up and down. So yes, in short, I do believe there's um, great opportunities for that. Uh, yeah. But it's not for me to say, and I think the idea of this framework is that we provide some examples, which we can load on YouTube, of ways to connect. Uh, and then a framework's intent is that you populate that with information that's specific to your environment and your understanding of where it is you work. And then you have ownership and sustainability because it's yours and it's not something that someone else has told you what to do. But the concepts is something that I think we've been alienated from so, for so long that there's uh, no understanding of what the pathway looks like. So I had a really good talk with Lance about that on the phone. I um, talked his bloody head off actually because it's one of my pet areas here and I think he went away going, holy shit, these guys are in a mess. But, uh, <laughs> maybe this clarifies a bit. Yeah, I think you say, just off the top of my head from coming off that, is like the Giant's Causeway. You know, so that's the most iconic that's a rare attraction. Maybe a bar, the Christmas here in Ireland, so we've got streams of people coming to it. And somebody was talking about going up there recently. Literally everybody stand with a piece of paper and something in their ear and their language interpreting what it is. But it's been if you know if you paddle that stretch of coastline and you see it <coughs> from the sea and you feel it from the, the sea level, there's a whole different complexion to that experience. It's got the connection with Scotland, it's got mythology, it's got a whole there's a whole range of stuff that, that can be going on around that story which is ancestral. So I, I don't think you have to look very far. Mm. Our folks really find tangible examples that you've been using. <coughs> Well, when I uh, presented down in Limerick, there was uh, the head of the department there who specialised in pedagogy. She was doing backflips on the stuff and wanted to be taught into the teachers' training courses there as soon as possible. So I said, I'm a bit busy, but we might be able to send someone <coughs> to talk with you. Well, the other thing that um, uh, I didn't offer to the other two groups, but there's individuals here that are travelling to New Zealand, we'll host you, we'll take you out and show you exactly what this looks like. <laughs> Next week, folks, there's a jungle one. <laughs> 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 okay. That's a good question. I don't know if it's smart, so I'm going to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> just, just I think in regards to the health inequalities and the statistics you showed from the Maori population, um, are the programs that you have in place with the culture and the roots, are they appealing for those individuals that potentially need to be active most from the sedentary and are they tying into them? Uh, well, I wouldn't go that far just yet. Yeah. Um, but what's useful is that it's appealing to a whole uh, range of ages. So right from some of our 80-year-olds down to the very youngest. The other thing I didn't tell you is that I've just finished a contract for the Ministry of Education and I've rewritten the health curriculum for national Māori schools. And this is going to be the information that's standard through all Māori schools uh, probably by uh, start of next year. So it's coming. Uh, Ministry of Health are uh, well aware that the demand from the Māori health sector to have this information included is coming, so the sector is shifting well. Did I answer your question or was it all? No, that's perfect. No, that's perfect. No, just we obviously have the same <coughs> problems of getting uh, opportunities for individuals to tie into those key activities for stop, so it's now they put a menu of activities in place for them to make the first step in stone. Yeah, yeah, well like I said, you know, we're trying to put as much on YouTube as we can so that people can see yeah. what's going on at home and abroad um, and recognise opportunities to engage in ways that they see fit for themselves. So that framework that I talked about, we've got 12 under deities and 12 under human form and you can come in at any point you want. So if you want to start at the individual because that's where you're most comfortable, then you can start there. But 
the idea is that there's a rationale at a higher level for why, not what we do, but why we should connect as the rationale that connects back to ancestry and knowledge, firstly. So uh, some of them are starting at that point and uh, taking a toe in the water, getting a feel for it and seeing what it looks like and starting to progress. But uh, initial findings around it is that we are moving people that haven't moved in 40, 50 years. We've got administrators from front desk at Māori health organisations that generally have KFC for most meals a day, taking their shoes off, lying on the ground and rolling through the bush with us to get in touch with what it means. And that's never happened. So we're shifting people that um, have been quite resilient to, to change. So we're, we're encouraged. We'll see. There's still time for someone to call me a dickhead. <laughs> I think that the perception that we would have is with other First Nation cultures in North America, predominantly that, that they have very similar problems, health <coughs> problems and everything else. And do you find like almost an instant buy-in from them as well in terms of, of the work? Yeah, yeah, definitely. A part of what we're doing over the, over the next little while is to uh, reintroduce some stuff that we started last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's much easier for them to make the next step in part. Like I don't think that... Um, your situation in Ireland is uh, going to be too challenging to make those envir environmental connections through um, mythology. There's a hell of a lot that I've read. Mm -hmm. you know, in my interest of what my grandfather was up to. So I've seen plenty there. Uh, the funny thing is with uh, other indigenous people is they've been colonised for a lot longer than we have. Um, we're probably the freshest on the block yeah. as far as natives go. And we're the most aggressive too. <coughs> Because we were talking about this on the way here, the environment of New Zealand is that it's the bottom, cold, hard place to get to. So the attitude of the people is always going to reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, when government makes suggestions, we don't like it. And we tell them where they can take that idea and turn it aggressively and do what we need to do. We've had a history of doing it, and that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. So other indigenous people look to Maori for some leadership with all humility, um, and we arrogantly go about our way of telling the world what they need. Who knows? You know, it's a, what we want to do is provide an opportunity to share. And we'll start that process with the hope that uh, groups like yourselves and them review what we're doing, look at it, and give us feedback and say, what have you thought of this? Well, that's crap. What about that? And that's where we're going to get our best opportunities because the collective brain power in this room is better for us to engage with than to ignore. And we can only see what we see in turn here and at home. This is important. So I'm going to give you some cards too, and I'd like you, if you could, to give me some feedback on today, some of the concepts. And if you've got time, not just a, gee, that was great kind of comment, which I've got plenty of already, I would rather know uh, some of the ideas of where you think it might fail, or why it might succeed, or how it might be able to put with you. And uh, like I said, we're more than happy to show you around our place. Well, thank you, uh, pleasure. Thank you from everybody here in the north and Ireland generally. <coughs> having you here, uh, I know as a company far and wide, it's made quite a few changes since being in New Zealand. Employing ecologists, for example, to work alongside the guides. Um, and our big next kind of conceptual move is about around nature and empathy. So, effectively, for whatever reason, be it industrialisation or the way our culture has gone, we would find particularly at the lower end of the scale, socially and economically kids who we bring out um, into the environment tend to have a more aggressive and fearful attitude and destructive attitude towards the environment. So it's kind of like, well, where does the empathy connection fail and why it's failed? And you don't need to actually answer the questions. It's like, well, how can you reconnect it? And I know from sessions we run, we can do it in two or three hours. So we can have somebody go and yuck, seaweed, evil, water, dirty. They snort in water through their system to clear their sinus, sinuses in two or three hours. But it takes maybe a certain couple of tweaks to your session to do that. So we're trying to reconnect that, you know, rebuild that connection between them and seeing themselves as part of the environment as opposed to using salt and bleach and saying, well, everything we have to kill it all. You know, so it's just part of our learning. Uh, but equally with ourselves, we're very much trying to host he and others to make those connections with the sector and have that conversation can have in the sector around environmental, um, I suppose, change and personal change. <coughs> the same thing. Thanks again for coming. And a very 
polite audience here. Thanks to you, Lawrence, for, for organising this. It's been fantastic. And certainly, I, I thought that was that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Very welcome. We're off to Garden tomorrow, so to the same time, Donny. Before we wrap up, I want to thank Lawrence too. It was a bit of a risk him having me come and didn't know. Me. And like I said, it could have gone bad. Got a time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's even more disappointed to hear that I don't drink, but that would have made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> and for his um, uh, support of some of these ideas, I mean, it was a great thing he did come to New Zealand, experiencing some of our culture and being so receptive to some of the concepts. So I'll applaud him as well on your side over here. <laughs>